am. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to share my screen. All right. Okay, well, thanks so much for that introduction, Pam. Um, it's great to be here. So I realize that over in the Eastern time zone, it's lunchtime and here in the Central time zone, it's almost lunchtime. So I thought I would start off with a food themed poll. So let's see if I can set this up. So the questions are, have you tasted wild rice before? And where do you think wild rice comes from? So just take a moment here to get some votes in. This is pretty neat to see the numbers coming in. All right, well, let's see if I've piqued people's appetites here. Maybe let it go just a little bit longer. All right, looks like it's stabilizing here. So let me post the results here. So it looks like actually a lot of you have had wild rice before, it's great. Um, and so for the second question, so actually no, wild rice is not cultivated in wild rice patties. And some of you did think so, not surprisingly, but I will also admit that the second question is totally a trick question because um, yeah, it's not cultivated in rice, in rice patties in Asia, but if you've had wild rice before, chances are it was cultivated in patties in California. But the real wild rice and the really natural wild rice grows naturally in shallow lakes and streams, like the one that you're looking at here across the Upper Great Lakes region. And so actually a lot of you got that part right. But as you can see here from this other picture, natural and cultivated wild rice really are very different. So probably what you've had is this cultivated rice. So natural wild rice is actually this really nice varied coloring. And if you tried them side by side, it's clear that the taste and the texture are quite different. So you can buy natural wild rice in a lot of different stores around here in the Upper Great Lakes region. And of course, you can find it online. And I really encourage you to check it out sometime. So um, wild rice is actually very special to those of us in the Upper Great Lakes region. Here in Minnesota, uh, wild rice is our beloved state grain. And for many Native Americans in this region, including the Anishinaabe and the Dakota, for them, wild rice is a profoundly important dietary, medicinal, cultural and spiritual resource. In fact, the Anishinaabe migration story is centered around wild rice. The Anishinaabe people came to this part of North America five centuries ago from the Northeast in search of their prophesied homeland where food grows on water. And so monomen, or the word for wild rice in the Anishinaabe language, monomen is the reason why they are here where they are today. And today, many Native Americans in this region continue to harvest and process wild rice using traditional methods like what you see here. Okay, so I don't think I need to do another poll to, to know that at least a lot of you out there are probably wondering whether I maybe wandered into the wrong cyber symposium to be talking about food and to be talking about Native American tribes. Because you're probably here expecting to be hearing about, you know, scientific research happening at places that look like this, right? And that's not surprising because by now you've heard about critical zone, critical zone observatories and nearly all of these are located in these types of high relief landscapes. And these critical zone observatories are intensive study sites where a lot of really important critical zone science was first established. But I'm really glad that the organizers of this symposium are really rallying to try to diversify our community because um, you know, not only do I think that this will lead to even deeper understanding about these important intensive study sites, but I think that's going to help take critical zone science everywhere, you know, beyond just these different sites. And in fact, at the AGU 2018 meeting, I actually kind of did a tally of the different abstracts that have been submitted to sessions that had critical zone science themes. And it turned out Actually, three quarters of the abstracts were actually looking at sites that were outside of these or similar types of intensive study sites. And in fact, at that, um, at that meeting, I was actually there talking about critical zone science work that I was doing with collaborators very far from these intensive study sites. We were working in remote and actually very sparsely monitored sites in the Ecuadorian Andes. But today, I'm actually going to talk about a different critical zone, one that will seem just as far from these different intensive study sites in terms of what its setting looks like, but it's actually just in my own backyard. And that's the critical zone of wild rice, which grows in shallow lakes and streams in the flat 
glaciated, formerly glaciated landscapes in the upper Great Lakes region. And if that weren't, you know, weird enough, I'm going to be talking about integrating, integrating ways of knowing this wild rice critical zone through collaborations with American Indian tribal partners. And what I really hope that you get out of these, this presentation by the end is an understanding of why this collaboration is so important. Okay, but first off, is wild rice actually a critical zone? Well, it turns out that wild rice is really sensitive to the biogeochemical reactions that are occurring by its root zone. In fact, wild rice usually doesn't grow where there are very high concentrations of sulfate occurring. And so my collaborators and I have been researching how sulfur interacts with organic material and with iron that's in the sediments in order to affect wild rice. And we've been focusing on how deeper groundwater interacts with surface water from above and how these interactions also depend on microbial processes. And so I would argue, yeah, I think we check enough of the boxes to qualify for the complexity of critical zone science. But there's another thing that I want to mention here. So in the western part of Minnesota, there are naturally occurring high concentrations of sulfate, and that's because of the geologic history there. But actually, the sites that I've been researching, those high concentrations of sulfate, they come from mining discharge waters. And so, other, so beyond just the classic rock, water, soil, organisms, and air factors that we tend to think of in critical zone science, we've also got the factor of humans here. And I would argue that this factor of humans is really important in critical zones around the world. And so that's why I was really glad that Evelyn Hinckley actually brought this up in her presentation yesterday too, which was coincidentally also about sulfur. And for wild rice, it's not just sulfate from mining that's a problem. Wild rice is also highly sensitive to human impacts on water levels and to climate change, as well as to invasive and competitive species. In fact, all these different sensitivities has led to the near decimation of wild rice across Michigan. It's led to a third of about, to about a decline of the about a third of the stands in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and it's led to decreases in stands throughout Canada. But the interaction between humans and wild rice isn't always negative. Tribes have been harvesters and stewards of wild rice for generations, and also many non-native people in the region are harvesting and certainly eating wild rice as family traditions now. And this connection for tribes, this connection with wild rice isn't just a cultural one, it's also a legal one. And that's because tribes access to wild rice is legally protected by treaties that have been signed by the US government in the 17 and 1800s. Okay, so as I think you're seeing here, humans play a really, really important role in the wild rice critical zone. But here's the thing, so maybe like some of you out there, um, I'm an introverted earth scientist. And yes, I am hugely motivated by problems that are societally relevant, but I've always felt more comfortable just working on the technical side. You know, I, I really want to work on the hydrological modeling, the reactive transport modeling, the statistical data and model integration. But as I was beginning to learn more about wild rice and tribes, I began to realize that I really couldn't with clear conscience keep ignoring the human side of the issue. And here's why. So in the 1800s, land colonization by Euro-Americans occurred in my home state of Minnesota. And in 1851, the state appropriated Dakota lands to in, or in order to establish the University of Minnesota, which is where I work today. So fast forward to the 1960s, University of Minnesota agronomists cultivated wild rice in patties. And this is what's, a lot of it's actually grown in California today. And they did this, they did this without tribal consent. And I can tell you that most native people consider the cultivation of wild rice to be deeply culturally offensive. To tribes, wild rice is sacred. To tribes, wild rice is a relative like a grandmother. That's actually how a lot of Native people have described it to me. And further, tribes are sovereign nations and their right to wild rice is a legal treaty right. And they've been concerned about the risks of genetic drift from these cultivated wild rice patties to natural wild rice stands. And tribes have made their uh, concerns about cultivated wild rice absolutely clear to the university. In a letter, they've written, we object to the exploitation of our wild rice for the pecuniary gain by mostly non-native people. And again, they've demanded a moratorium on genomic research and genetic research of wild rice. 
Now in 2014, I moved to the University of Minnesota. In 2015, I began researching wild rice waters. And I have to confess that I did it without any tribal input. And meanwhile, while I was focusing on the, you know, quote, real science of wild rice waters, the University of Minnesota was accepting state funds to reinvigorate their cultivated wild rice research programs. And this was fueling tensions with the tribes. And so I began to realize with this fraught history, I really had to change the way that I was approaching this problem. And so a few years ago, I brought together an interdisciplinary team from across the University of Minnesota in order to look at both the ecological and the human dimensions of wild rice, all under the understanding of its profound cultural importance to Native American tribes. And this time I had not only my collaborators in the geosciences, but I actually finally had a plant ecologist and I had social scientists from different backgrounds. And we were fortunate enough to receive a generous seed grant from the University of Minnesota's Grand Challenges Program and the Institute on the Environment to do this interdisciplinary work. But as, we start, but as we started this work, I started to realize that there was still something wrong with this picture. So sure, I now had the people who think about the people who care about wild rice, but what about those people who actually care about wild rice? And so that's why now, today, this is where our project is. This is the list of the entire project team. And in red are the names of tribal members and tribal representatives who are on our team. And these include um, native researchers, native students. They include tribal natural resource managers. They include tribal uh, rice harvesters. And our project was given this Anishinaabe name, Kowe Gadan Nanagarawan Damen Monomen, which means First, we must consider Monomen, our wild rice, to remind everyone on the project that really the goal of the project was to be protecting a sacred plant. So you might be asking, how did we get here? How did we get to this tremendous list of collaborators that I'm showing you here? Well, I can assure you, it certainly did not happen overnight. And actually, it took a huge amount of learning and really a lot of hard work. So you see, remember this timeline? Well, here we were in 2018, our interdisciplinary project was beginning really at the height of tensions between tribes and the university around wild rice. But I have to confess something again. So at this point, I was certainly understanding more about the unfortunate interactions that tribes had had with the university, but I still didn't fully understand the extent of it. I have to say that at that point, I had still never directly heard a tribal person describe to me how it felt to them to have their sacred monomen, their sacred wild rice desecrated by university researchers. I didn't know that tribal people often get written into grant proposals in order to you know, meet outreach requirements without them even ever having, ever having been asked. I didn't know that researchers often trespass on a reservation lands in order to take their field samples. I didn't know that tribes have allowed geologists onto their lands in order to do research projects, only to have mining companies come and try to appropriate their lands, even though that wasn't actually what the geologists intended in the first place. But you know what? I really should have known. And when tribes realized that some of us really hadn't done the full work to understand our history and what we needed to be doing differently, they sternly made it clear that we needed to do so if we really wanted to work together. And so at this point, I want to actually acknowledge that with all the different events that have been going on, I think a lot of us have been thinking about what are the ways that we can support marginalized communities around us. And a lot of us have been trying to figure out what's really the right way to start, doing, start going about doing this. And I might suggest from my experience that we all make sure that we really understand our history and, you know, what it what is our situation through all of this? And so just to kind of help you get through this, I've set up another poll here. Let's see if I can launch this one here. And I'd like, I'd like to think, I'd like to know, I'd like you to think about, can you name the indigenous peoples on whose land you've lived? And this includes where you grew up, where you went to school or where you go to work now. So I grew up in Portland, Maine. I went to school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I now live here in Minneapolis. And I can tell you that I actually had to look up the answer for where I grew up and where I went to school. And honestly, I don't really know if I'd know the answer for sure for Minneapolis if it weren't for this Wild Rice Project. And another question, 
even if you can name those indigenous peoples, do you actually know the history that your community or your institution have has had with these indigenous peoples? So I've got to say, I've learned so much in the last couple of years, but I'm still definitely learning. And this third question is just so that I can have an idea um, just for my own curiosity for what region in the world you're answering these questions. Well, great. It looks like a lot of you, some of you are getting through this, but it's slowing down a little bit. So I think I'll just share the results here so far. And yeah, similar to me, you know, I think I had to look it up for some of the places. So I'm really glad that um, that many of you know the answer for some of the places that you've lived. And I hope maybe afterwards you can look up for those other places. Um, and for those of you who don't live on other indigenous people's lands, if you were at the 2018 AGU meeting in San Francisco, uh, you might be interested to know that you were on the Ohlone land, on the lands of the Ohlone. Um, yeah, and it looks like even though we might be able to name the indigenous peoples, it looks like we all could have a lot of work to do to understand the histories that we've had. All right. So going back here with our project, I think the tribes were absolutely right to call us out on the fact that we were starting down the path of so many of the same wrongs that other researchers have done before us. And so when we realized this, we did something that I knew was risky for for our academic careers. We actually put aside our original proposed research plan, which included some, but definitely inadequate input from tribes. And instead, we realized that we needed to be prioritizing tribal sovereignty and tribal perspectives. And so we spent the first entire, the, the first half of the entire first year traveling around Minnesota and Wisconsin, visiting different tribes and different tribal organizations. And we listened. We simply listened without any agenda. Agenda. We listened to their concerns about wild rice and the perspectives about it. And we listened to their concerns about university researchers. And we also organized twice per year collaboration conferences. And this gave an opportunity to, to have over a dozen different tribes and tribal organizations across Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michi and Michigan, and even from some from Canada to come together and share their different ideas about what should or should not be happening in this project. But I'll say the turning point probably really came when we started to recruit Native and non-Native students for this project. What we realized is that they really became a common rallying point for both the university researchers and tribes because we all shared this common goal of trying to train the next generation to be even better scientists and even better stewards of the environment. And now these diverse group of students, they're showing us through example, what it looks like to reach across different experiences and backgrounds in order to work together. And I would say our partnerships really started to build when some tribes invited us out to some of their wild rice sites of concern. And as we spent time together out there thinking about what could be going on with the wild rice, we started to build our relationships. Now, I will mention that throughout all of this, I was a pre-tenure assistant professor and I definitely had a colleague make very clear to me that he thought that I was spending way too much time on outreach. Now, it is a sad, sad thing, in my opinion, that doing something positive for society can be criticized. But, you know, I also get that that's part of the culture and the worldview of our academic institutions. But, you know, what really, really upset me was this assumption that we were doing all this somehow just for charity. So one thing that I want to make absolutely clear in this presentation is that collaborating with tribes has taught me more than any other project has. And it is making our science so much better. And I can assure you that every single university team member on this project feels exactly the same way. So you see, as we were beginning to get to know our tribal partners better, some of them, has, some of them have begun to share just a bit about how they think about Monoman, our wild rice in the Anishinaabe language. They always think about Monoman in relationship with all the other non-human and human elements around it. In fact, Native scholars have called Indigenous knowledge holistic, integrative, relational. And I would say this is really in contrast with Western science, what we study, which tends to take apart all the different pieces and, to, and separate them into different disciplines. And then we get these new Western science initiatives like, you know, critical zone science, where we're after the fact trying to put the pieces back together again. 
And sometimes we're still missing pieces. Like we still tend to separate, want to separate that human piece from the natural, from the natural system. And so what's become really unexpected is that some of our tribal partners have been asking us to include ways that they think about wild rice, um, to include it together with our Western science, because I think they're seeing that we're not getting all the pieces on our own. And I want to say that this was actually really unexpected that they asked this, because we knew by this point not to expect that they would simply share their knowledge with us. You see, they have they have experienced a long history of appropriation, right? They've had their land appropriated, they've had their resources appropriated, they've had their culture appropriated. They're not about to have their knowledge appropriated by us as well. And so we've truly felt deeply honored that they've been willing to share some of the ways that they understand the Monoman Criticals, critical zone or the wild rice critical zone with us so that we can collectively better understand this system. And so together with our tribal partners, we've begun to arrive at some new conceptual models for wild rice, in which wild rice actually depends on the careful balance of a number of different factors in the environment around it. And we believe that this is why it's often really hard to actually know what is the exact cause for impairment of wild rice in a particular lake or stream. It's because we probably can't just pinpoint it down to one single factor. Now, with proper management, we can kind of maintain this careful balance, but otherwise human actions can serve to perturb one of these factors, which can cause a niche in which wild rice can grow to contract, allowing other plants to come in and outcompete it. Now we've just been starting to look at some of these factors with our tribal partners in, this, in the sites that they're concerned about. And here's a little bit of what we're starting to find. At one wild rice river, um, one reach that had dense wild rice was experiencing upwelling of groundwater, while in contrast, another reach that had only very sparse wild rice was experiencing down, downwelling of surface water. Now, I've got to say that at this point, we really don't know what this means here, but it certainly has us wondering whether this could be creating different nutrient levels between these two sites. I also wanted to mention that one of our tribal partners was explaining to me that we have a word for that part of the stream bed where water from above meets water from below. And this really intrigued me because I'm a hydrologist and in hydrology, we have a word for that. That's the hyperreic zone. And you know what? It's become pretty trendy lately to study that. But the Anishinaabe, they've, had, they've long had a word for that in their everyday vocabulary to be thinking about these concepts. So a number of our tribal partners have also been urging us to look at the sediments at their sites. And once again, we still don't really know what this all means, but at the site that had sparse rice in it, there was a staggering four and a half meters of this really loose high organic muck. And, you know, we've been now asking ourselves what kind of hydrological disturbance could have caused this and maybe could it be impairing the growth, the uh, germination of wild rice seeds. Now, I was also kind of scratching my head here, wondering why so many of our tribal partners were interested in the sediment, because actually in the Western literature, there's really little mention about there being any connection between sediments and wild rice. Well, one tribal partner explained it to me. She said, of course we think about the sediment. It's what muskrat picked up and put on turtles back in our origin story. So you see a different worldview, and all of a sudden we have a fresh idea of what to look at in our research. Now, I do really want to emphasize that tribes aren't simply waiting around for us Western scientists to go in and help them and rescue them with their problems here. Tribal natural resource departments have their own rigorous research programs going on. And this is providing us with really, uh, really strong launching points for our collaborative research. For example, some of our tribal partners have already conducted climate change impact assessments uh, using physically downscaled climate projections. And what they're finding is that wild rice is highly vulnerable to climate change. And so based on all this, we're now planning on looking at how climate change not only directly affects wild rice waters, but also how it affects upland vegetation, which of course controls the amount of runoff that reaches these wild rice lakes and streams. Okay, so I will say that at this point, you're probably seeing that we have many more questions than we actually have answers. But we do have one very concrete result so far. And I'm confident that this is going to be one of the most important contributions of our project overall. And it is that 
studying wild rice has taught all of us how to do research in a way that is more culturally and ethically responsible, collaborative, and interdisciplinary. And this was only possible when we actually took the time in the beginning to build our relationships, to build respectful and accountable relationships. So we've just, uh, we've just submitted our first manuscript from this project, and it's on that very important, crucial relationship building part of the project. And this paper has 37 co-authors on it, including tribal and university team members. And the appendix of this manuscript includes our project's written protocol, which provides guidelines on how to do responsible and ethical research on wild rice. And this written protocol has helped keep all of us accountable to our tribal partners. So I wanna say that we submitted this manuscript to the journal uh, in mid-May. 10 days later was the murder of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis, actually really close to where I live. So yet another unarmed black man murdered by a police officer. So again, if conversations at your institution are anything like mine right now, we're trying to figure out how to fight the injustices and inequities that permeate our community. And I say in our science and engineering community, we need to face and address the problem of underrepresentation of Hispanics, Blacks, and American Indians and Alaskan Natives in our institutions. And I would say that there is an ethical demand that we fix this picture right here for underrepresented minorities. But I'd also like to point out that it's not just an ethical demand. I would say there's also an intellectual demand for all of us. And that's because diversity really does make our science better. Now, I can tell you that I know this anecdotally through my experiences on the Wild Rice Project, but also there was this recent PNAS paper that came out by Hofstra and other colleagues at Stanford University. They found that demographically underrepresented students, and this includes racial minorities and women, demographically underrepresented students innovate at higher rates than majority students. But you know what? It's not enough just to get underrepresented students into the doors of our educational institutions. And that's because even though they're innovating at higher rates, this study also found that their novel contributions are being discounted. What a loss, not only for them, but for the entire scientific community that had so much to gain from their innovations. And so I can attest that in our project, by recognizing tribal sovereignty and prioritizing tribal perspectives, this has allowed us to transform the way we understand the wild rice critical zone. And you know what? It's paying off. Our project was just awarded grants from the USGS and NSF in order to continue to strengthen our partnerships and to continue to find ways to integrate our ways of knowing. And none of this would have been possible without our diverse group of university, uh, diverse group of university researchers and students and with our tribal partners. And so I'll actually, stop, I'll actually end off here with uh, three different projects that I'd like to pose to you, three different questions that I'd like to pose to you. Do you want to deepen our understanding of the critical zone by expanding critical zone science to places that you know and you care about? Do you want to help us understand how all different types of processes, importantly, including interactions with humans, influence the critical zone? And finally, do you want to bring together diverse perspectives, including your own, to spark innovation and grow our knowledge about the critical zone? So I'd say if you answered yes to any of these questions, we wholeheartedly welcome you to join our Critical Zone community. And so if you'd like to learn more, please visit our project website or please do just directly contact me. My email is down here below. And also our project's recruiting. So if you're interested in integrating ways of knowing to understand the wild rice critical zone, please don't hesitate to contact me. And with that, I thank you. And if we have time, I'm happy to take any questions.